further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's presenters and tonight's program. So this program all started a couple months ago when um, the Queen's Gambit first came out. And the first person that I thought of was my good friend and fellow improviser, Micah Mori, who just radiates enthusiasm about chess. And he had the wonderful idea of bringing in uh, Rusa Goletiani, who is just, who is an international master. So um, I, I have to give you guys a lot of credit um, for, for just doing this with me. And we're really excited to do this exclusive program for New Canaan Library. So um, The Queen's Gambit, the Netflix blockbuster series about a chess prodigy, which has ignited skyrocketing sales of chess boards and a new national obsession with the game. But before the glamorous world of Beth Harmon, international master Rusa Goletiani and expert, and expert coach Mike Amori we're fully steeped in the world of chess competitions and coaching. This program will take you into the real world of competitive, high stakes chess, drawing on parallels from the Queen's Gambit to illuminate true tales of confronting gender inequalities, competing against masters, and the life skills and benefits that the ancient game can have. Rusa Goletiani was born in Soku Sokumi, Georgia, the country, where she learned how to play chess at the age of six and started to play tournaments shortly after. She has, won war, um, she has won world youth champions for girls under 14, 16, and 18, and became women's grandmaster in 1999. After moving to the US in 2000, Rusa became an international master, won, won the 2003 continental champion and the prestigious 2005 US women's championship. Rusa has represented the United States at several chess Olympiads, winning an individual silver and a team bronze medal in Dresden of 2008. She consistently taught chess to students while, playing while also playing professionally. And in 2015, she transitioned to a career in finance. Rusa still gives lectures, thankfully for us, and um, gives the occasional lessons along with supporting her own kids' interest in chess. And I think that everybody in the audience can agree that Rusa, your kids are probably have the best coaching, <laughs> free coaching included. That's great. Um, our, our other presenter tonight, Micah Mori, um, began playing seriously, began playing chess seriously in 1990 while working on the floor of the American Stock Exchange of all places. Through a series of twists, he left finance. Unlike Rusa, they kind of did a uh -huh. uh, <laughs> did a little switcheroo yeah. there. He left finance to teach um, chess professionally. He believes that chess is a valuable teaching tool and has spent 29 years teaching it to over 50 schools and adult programs in the New York and Connecticut areas. Mike is a USCF rated expert and has played more than 850 tournaments to date. Together with good friend and colleague, international master, Rusa Golianti, Golianti, they formed the Westchester Chess Academy, where the emphasis was on what they call the three C's, confidence, calculation, and concentration. The goal was to help students develop transferable skills that can be used in the real world, in real time, Guys, I'm so excited for your presentation tonight. It's gonna be so much fun. Um, and I'm just gonna turn off and uh, start sharing my screen. Okay. Oh, no peeking. <laughs> All right, can you see my screen? Oops. Yeah, we can. All we right, can. let her rip. All right, hello everyone. I'm so super excited to be here. Thank you very much, Julia Ray, for a nice introduction and for putting this um, Zoom meeting together. And thank you all for joining us today. I'm really excited to share uh, my experience with you um, about Queen's Gambit and chess in general and uh, tell you a little bit about my chess career. So if we go to the next slide, you know, I, lo I love Queen's Gambit, you know, and I, I joke a lot about this because you probably have seen this joke about, uh, um, you know, daughter asking dad about 2020 pandemic. And he says, oh, you know, we all got so bored that we watched um, a show about uh, chess. You know, it's pretty funny because chess really hasn't been that popular in the US um, after Bobby Fischer, let's put it that way, right? But I personally come from a country of Georgia where chess is super popular and it always has been very popular. 
as a matter of fact, um, back in a day when women used to get married, uh, their parents would give uh, her a chess set as a wedding gift. That's how popular chess has always been. And also we have two women's world champions from country of Georgia. So for nearly uh, 30 years, women's world championship title was in Georgia. And let's not forget, Georgia is a very small country, only 3 million people. So uh, with that kind of success, you know, you can imagine how popular chess was. Almost every kid or every girl, I should say, plays chess in Georgia. So um, when my dad decided to teach my sister first, she was two years older than me. Uh, my sister didn't really like it that much because she was one of those kids that couldn't really sit still for more than two minutes. Um, so he gave up on her and then he taught me and I just loved the game. And I got into it pretty quickly. And uh, he uh, put me to a chess school once he realized I had a talent for the game. And it probably took me about three years to beat my dad. And my dad was really good. I mean, he was not a professional chess player, but he played in um, high school. He played in college at his work. And, you know, he was a pretty accomplished guy. You know, uh, he, had, he was a university professor. So when I started to beat him at, nine, at age of nine, he was quite upset. You know, you would think he was happy for his daughter, but no, he was actually pretty upset that he couldn't beat me. And uh, I really got a lot of support from my family. I started to travel first nationally and then internationally. Um, I came to the U.S. for the first time in 1990 to play um, World Junior Championship under 12. Um, I remember time for third in that tournament. It was my first uh, uh, World Junior Championship. And I thought it was a pretty good result. But when I got back home, I remember my dad hugging me at the airport and telling me, it's okay, sweetheart, you'll do better next time. As if, you know, a uh, time for third of the world youth was a big failure. You know, of course, you know, he always wanted me to be number one. <laughs> That's how uh, he always tried to raise me. But, you know, he did give me a lot of support. And then... Uh, uh, when I moved here in 2000, actually, to pursue my chess career, um, it was actually pretty funny because uh, when people would ask me where I'm from, I would say I'm, I'm from Georgia, and they would be like, mm, Atlanta, Georgia? But your accent is uh, different. And then I would say, no, no, I'm from real Georgia. <laughs> and they would laugh. You know, I, I think now everybody knows where that's 20 years ago, you know, people were not sure uh, which Georgia I was from. So, uh, you know, chess has been part of my life throughout my um you know whole you know career right i did transition away from chess in 2015 uh for finance but you know julia ray i think i will also go um take my mike's path you know i'm sure one day i will leave finance and go back to teaching chess but you know i i have been um teaching chess for 15 years mike and i we formed uh, a chess academy together and we taught uh, a lot of kids and we both just really love the game and it has just so many benefits and a lot of transferable skills that you can learn from chess. But well, going back to Queen's Gambit, you know, I, I really did enjoy this show because it made chess very popular. You know, I had so many people reach out to me and say, did you watch chess, uh, Queen's Gambit? You know, we watched it, we thought about you. This is so cool. This is such a great game. And I joke now, you know, this show made uh, chess popular, but also it made me very popular, <laughs> at least amongst my friends and colleagues. Um, but, you know, watching chess ga uh, Queen's Gambit was quite emotional for me because, uh, you know, while I didn't become a, a world champion like uh, Beth Harmon, uh, I did uh, experience a lot, of a lot of the same things that she actually went through, especially as a kid. And uh, we can... Uh, see how she gets into chess, right? You know, her mom um, gets killed in a car accident and then she ends up in an orphanage and she's really lonely there, right? And chess is something that really keeps her um, going, right? She falls in love with this game and she's uh, thinking about chess every day, right? You know, especially at night when she has time to be alone, she looks at the ceiling and she all she she sees is a chessboard and pieces moving around. And I really relate to her in that sense because uh, when I was um, 11, my actually my mother got into a car accident and she passed away. It was really difficult times for me, obviously. You know, I felt like 
uh, it was the time where I needed my mother the most. And also my mom was the person who used to travel with me all the time, you know, to tournaments. Because back then, you know, the chess tournaments that I played were not weekend tournaments. They were actually 10 day long or, or two weeks long tournaments. And she was always there for me. And one day, uh, driving from a chess tournament, going back home, she got into a car accident and unfortunately passed away, which was really devastating. Um, and then shortly after that, there was a war in my hometown. And unfortunately, one day my father said, you know, we have to leave our home. Uh, please grab whatever you need to grab next five, 10 minutes. And we have to leave for the airport. We're, we have to leave the hometown. And the only thing I really grabbed was my chess notebook because chess was a big part of my life. You know, I, this was something that I did more than anything else. Uh, and I love the game. So uh, it's pretty ironic that, you know, chess notebook was the only thing I took with me. And unfortunately we were never able to go back to my hometown. We, we lost the territory and it's co considered a conflict zone right now. So I moved to the uh, capital, Tbilisi. Um, and there I was, you know, in a new town. I didn't know anyone. I went to a new school. Everything was new to me. We really uh, went through a hard time. You know, I have lost my mom and I've lost, um, you know, everything basically I owned. And chess was the only thing that really kept me going. But I let, let Mike introduce himself and then I'll, I'll move on. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, everybody. And uh, Julia Ray, thank you so much. And thanks uh, all of you for tuning in uh, from home. Uh, so yeah, so I'm, I'm coming up on 30 years teaching this crazy game. And I, I've done it in every capacity you can imagine. I, I've taught lunchtime programs, after school programs, part of the curriculum. Uh, Russ and I got together, we were training tournament players on the weekend. And then I was also a player. I, I've logged, you know, a boatload of hours over the board in a competitive sense. And um, it kind of all starts here. So it's kind of bizarre. I have the American Stock Exchange as my beginning, but that's really where I learned how to play chess. And when I was on the floor, when things got slow, we would play a little bit. And there was an option trader named Ron Henley, uh, who was an international grandmaster. And, and he comes up to me one day and he goes, you know, you're getting into chess. You know, there's the Manhattan Chess Club where Carnegie Hall is. I had no idea it even existed. So I go home one day, I walk into the Manhattan Chess Club and I'm just like, head over heels with chess. And I start playing tournaments. And um, I left the exchange because the business, there was a lot more computerized trading going on with every intention of coming back to finance. But what happened was I started to get engrossed in, in chess here in Westchester. I met Sunil Wiramantri, who everybody uh, in the chess world knows is, uh, was a prominent teacher. And I started to uh, teach. Uh, but the real beginning for me, uh, is because of this guy, Artie Halpern. How I got on the exchange was because of an interview that changed my life. And I got the interview by putting up a postcard or like a little babysitting card in an AMP in uh, Millwood, New York, Thanksgiving, I think 1984, I'm 22 years old. And I wrote on the postcard that I was a, uh, a graduate student looking to work with an investor just for experience, but I lied. I was not a graduate student. I was, I was trying to complete a BS in finance. So a little more emphasis on the BS, if you know what I mean. So the very next day I get a call from this guy and he convinces me to go to his house and he interviews me. And what I noticed right away was he didn't ask me a single question about finance. And what he ended up doing that day is he taught me something about education that I've used as the bedrock of the foundation for the way I teach and the principles I believe in. What he managed to do in 10 minutes, he kind of built a timeline and went backwards. And he found out that, you know, I was driving a taxi. I, I worked in a laundry mat. I had all these odd jobs. He also find, found out that my dad passed away my very first day of high school. So Roos and I had this connection from the very beginning. He kept probing a little bit and he found out that I dropped out of high school February of my senior year. And it didn't dawn on me then, but it dawned on me many years later what he was doing is he wanted to know what he had in front of him, which is something that I always try to do as a teacher. You have to know your students, whether it's an individual, whether it's a class, you have to do your best as an educator 
to really get a feel for what's in front of, of, uh, front of you as a teacher. At the end of the interview, now you've got to remember, he's doing this timeline. He leans into me, he goes, uh, by the way, you seem to be a little young to be a graduate student. So I'm, I'm busted, right? I turn red as a beat and he goes, don't worry about it. He writes his name on a card, writes an address. He goes, be here Monday morning, wear a tie. And I have a virtual background. I hope you can see this, but I actually have the tie that I wore that day on the exchange. So this little twist of events uh, somehow has me here in front of all of you today. So this is what I sort of look like on an everyday basis teaching kids. And uh, now if, if I'm not mistaken, I was trying to press the little guy playing white, he's down a bishop as to what happened to that bishop because the last time I had made a loop around the class, there was a bishop on the board and somehow we lost it. Uh, but anyway, I'm gonna share a lot more with you later on and, and I'll get into the, uh, my individual presentation. But thank you all very much again for coming tonight. Right, so going back to uh, me playing chess, you know, here uh, I'm showing some pictures from when I was a kid and when I first moved to the US and the picture on the right hand side is uh, fairly recent, uh, me playing uh, US championship. And chess really always has, and it will always uh, be part of my life and part of who I am because I, I just can't imagine my life without chess. It has helped me in so many ways uh, throughout my uh, whole life. But you know, uh, when I when I first moved to my, the capital of Georgia, Tbilisi, uh, and I was as I was saying, you know, the times were really difficult. You know, I had lost my mother, um, and I had you know lost everything that belonged to me, including my house. Um, but, you know, chess was really something that kept me going, similar to Beth Harmon, you know, like it was my life. It was something that I did every day and I looked forward to uh, playing chess. Um, I'm sure as, as many of you know, you know, playing chess takes tremendous concentration. You know, back in the day, games were even longer. You know, I would play six hour, even seven hour games, right? And it really only takes one move to lose a game. So if you lose your concentration, even just for a few seconds, you know, you could basically throw the game away. So in order to play a really good game, you have to be able to completely forget about existence of another world besides chess, right? And you have to immerse yourself in this game, dedicate yourself uh, to this game and really do your best. And that's what I did, you know, when I played chess, that's how I played it. And I think, chess world was something that really kept me going because the outside world was not as easy, right? Uh, and it was kind of difficult to deal with everything that was happening in my life, but chess really gave me that highlight. Uh, and here I mentioned, you know, it is very hard to achieve good results without dedicated supporters, you know, and we know we saw in the movie, um, her first coach, Mr. Scheibel, right, who introduced her to the game and then her friends that really were supporting here. I think they are talking to her, analyzing her game and like really rooting for her to win the world championship, right? If you don't have supporters, if you don't have people that really are next to you, it's very hard to achieve good results. I think Kasparov once said, in order to become a good chess player, you have to have dedicated parents or dedicated coach. And I was fortunate to have both. Um, my parents were dedicated to my chess. I remember when I would study chess, everybody in my family would walk on their tippy toes and make sure that everybody was quiet so I would not get distracted, right? And then um, my friends have been very supportive. You know, Mike has been extremely supportive of my chess when I played US championships, you know, or Olympiad, he was number one fan. And, you know, when I had tough games, I often called him and he would encourage me and you know, always uh, uh, be there and help me to get through uh, tough, tough games. So uh, it, it's great. You know, I remember actually uh, my principal in high school uh, in Georgia, he was so supportive of me. You know, he would actually uh, come into the classroom and say, Golapiani, you come with me. And then I would get out, I would be, you know, worrying about, oh my gosh, am I in trouble? Why is the principal calling me? And he would say, okay, you come with me and you play chess with me, okay? So he would bring me in his room, set up a chess board, say, okay, play me. And then I would beat him and he would get so upset. Okay, go back to class. And then, you know, he would do that all over again. I think he would study maybe for a week or two 
to and then challenge me again, but I beat him every time. But you know what? They, they really supported me and they said, you know what? You don't worry about school, you know, play your chess tournaments. And that's what I did. You know, I traveled, I played. And this is a great scene also from uh, Queen's Gambit, you know, where it really shows how popular chess is in Russia. And I would say, you know, in all former Soviet Union, um, Soviet Union countries, again, I think Kasparov said that he's very lucky that it's, it was chess uh, and not baseball that was so popular in Soviet Union, right? <laughs> so you can think of chess as a, a, a baseball for the US, you know, uh, here people are all the uh, people in the park are just so excited to meet Beth Harmon uh, and play with her and they all know about her. So, you know, uh, again, you know, I had that same experience, you know, when I would win chess tournaments as a kid, Everybody was super excited for me. You know, in my school, they had a picture of me in the entrance. All my classmates knew about me. It was just, you know, a great support. And sometimes, you know, my students or some other coaches will ask, you know, what is it in Soviet Union or in former Soviet Union that made chess so popular? You know, what's the, what is the secret, right? And I joke, you know, there is no secret. It's hard work and dedication that really, you know, gets you um, to the top. Uh, and, and the support from, from everywhere, right? And then back to my uh, chess career, uh, I think uh, once I moved to the US, um, the biggest tournaments that I played here or the, the biggest achievements in the US were winning um, US championship in 2005 and then winning uh, an Olympiad medal, which were the two highlights of my chess career. And they were very different, actually, because, you know, I think it's very different playing individual tournaments versus team tournaments, you know, uh, because when you play for yourself, you know, yes, it's a lot of pressure, but at least, you know, you're only, if you're losing, you're only disappointing yourself. Uh, and I remember playing US Championship in 2005. Um, I started quite hard for this tournament. You know, I would um, analyze a lot of games, do a lot of chess puzzles, and really, you know, immerse myself daily into chess. And then when I got to the tournament, I, I really played very well. You know, I, I had a great tournament and I tied for first, but I remember going into tie breaks. You know, I had to play my good friend, Tateva Brahamian in the tie breaks. And I just could not sleep that night. I was so extremely nervous that I just couldn't relax. All I could think about I'm so close, you know, I really want to win this, you know, how do I make this work? And I remember, you know, looking at the clock, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., I just couldn't sleep. And I think it was 5 a.m. that I finally burst into tears. I called my husband, I woke him up, I said, you have to help me, what do I do? You know, I have the most important game of my life tomorrow and I just cannot sleep. But, you know, somehow I pulled it off. I was able to put myself together. Um, I think that's one good thing that I've uh, learned through chess, being able to concentrate even when I'm distracted, right? I remember one of the US championships I played was um, near the airport. And uh, a lot of chess players complained because, you know, we could hear planes taking off and landing every like couple of minutes, but it really didn't bother me a bit. And I remember why not, when I was a kid, my coach would actually put TV on really loud and let me do puzzles. He said, okay, you know what? Yes, I know there's a lot of noise in the background, but you really need to uh, learn how to concentrate with the noise in the background. And I recently shared that story with my friend and she laughed at me. And I said, you know, why are you laughing? Said, do you really believe that's why he put the TV on? He was actually watching TV himself and enjoying TV while you were doing your work. <laughs> Maybe that was the reason, but nevertheless, you know, it really helped me to um, learn how to concentrate with noise in the background. So I was one of the few uh, participants at the uh, U.S. championship that, you know, didn't really get bothered by the airplanes taking off and landing every couple of minutes or so. And in this picture here, you know, I remember uh, like yesterday playing at the Olympiad in 2008. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, in order to do well at a team tournament takes a lot more effort because it's not just you, right? I mean, your result really affects your teammates and you just have to be really close with everyone and you really need to um, have a great team spirit and really root for each other, right? And we were able to pull it off, you know, 
Uh, this is us, you know, accepting our reward at the closing ceremony. Definitely was one of the uh, biggest highlights of my life. I actually remember going into the last round and I was again so nervous, you know, being nervous as a chess player is part of our life. You know, I mean, maybe there are some few chess players that don't get nervous, but when it gets to me, I always get nervous. Actually, I, as a kid, I remember my friend told me once, this is crazy. Why do you play this game? You get so nervous. I was, I couldn't watch you play. You know, your whole body was shaking. I was like, really? I didn't even notice, you know? Yeah, but going into the last round of the Olympiad, I was so nervous. I um, pulled my coach, Gregory Kaidanov, and I said, Gregory, I'm really nervous. Please, what is your last advice going into the last round? Because I knew if I won, if the team won, we had a really good chance to win the medal. And he looked at me, he realized I was nervous. And he said, come on, Rusa, just forget about everything and play chess. So, <laughs> I think that was one of the best advice uh, I ever got. So that's exactly what I did. And I was able to pull it off. And uh, we won the medal. And that was the uh, best uh, feeling of, uh, you know, my chess career. And I mean, here, you know, um, on the left hand side, uh, you see a corporate chess challenge that I played um, a couple of years ago. Um, while I transitioned from you know competitive chess into finance, I still try to play chess once in a while when the opportunity comes up. And a friend of mine organized a corporate chess challenge where a lot of banks actually played with uh, each other. And Deutsche Bank that I represented with my friends, we were able to um, win here. So that was great. But on the right hand side, actually, I want to remember a story about losing because I keep talking about winning and you're probably all wondering, well, did she ever uh, lose a game? Because all she talks about is how great it feels to win. But I do have a lot of painful losses that I uh, remember. And one of them I will share with you when I was probably about 16 years old in Georgia, um, I was playing this tournament, uh, 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 Georgian championship. Um, and if I won first place, I would go uh, to represent uh, Georgia in the World Youth Championship. Now, if I became second, I would represent uh, Georgia in the European Championship. Now, if I got third place, I got nothing. So, you know, again, I was playing really well. I did uh, win like six and a half points out of seven. And in my last two rounds, I needed a draw to win the whole tournament, a draw in two games. But one secret I'll share with you, I was never able to play for a draw, unfortunately. Um, it's very hard to play for a draw because chess is not made for a draw. You know, chess is more made for a win. You know, you have to get in there. You got to do your best and you got to try to win. I tried to play for a draw. It didn't work. I offered my opponent a draw. She didn't accept. I lost. Okay, now I'm going into the last round. Same scenario. I need to draw in order to win the tournament. I offer my opponent a draw. He says, no, I play for a draw. It just does not work. And I'm, I'm about to resign. And I remember telling myself, okay, I'm losing this game. I'm about to resign. Rusa, please do not cry in front of everyone. So I shake hands with my opponent as quickly as I can. I left the chess hall and there was a park right next to the chess palace. I ran into the park, burst in, burst it in tears, really upset, completely devastated. A couple of friends followed me. They wanted to approach me to make me feel better, but they couldn't because I was crying my eyes out and they didn't know what to say. But I was in the park. I didn't care that there were people walking in the park. So when people saw me cry that badly, you know, they would walk to my friends and say, oh my gosh, is she okay? Did she lose a parent? And they would say, no. I mean, did her boyfriend leave her? No. But why is she crying so badly? Oh, she lost a chess game. She lost that. She's crying like that because she lost a chess game. She must be really crazy. But that's how devastating it is to uh, lose a game. And that year I didn't go to a world youth or European championship. So that was really upsetting. And this is last slide that I have here, you know, with a bunch of my students uh, on the left hand side. I think we have one Katie is actually attending today. Ben also on the bottom right uh, attending and hi Ben. He's playing with my dad in this picture. You know, another reason why chess is great and I love chess because chess has no boundaries. You know, it has, it's a universal language, right? 
you can be from one part of the world, like my dad is from Georgia, he doesn't really speak English, he's playing band, but they are able to communicate through chess. They can also go over the game after they are done, right? Chess is its own language. And also, it doesn't matter how old you are, right? I mean, Ben is probably about 12, 13 in this picture. My dad is about 80, right? But it doesn't matter. They're playing a great game. And, you know, on the top right, you see my kids playing chess at national championship. And uh, on the left-hand side, I'm giving a lecture um, to a lot of kids, to a lot of girls uh, in Central Park, actually. There is a chess club uh, in Central Park. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and another funny story actually about me getting into um, teaching chess. How did I get into teaching chess is, is actually pretty funny. When I first moved into the US in 2000, um, you know, my, ch my, you know, my chess was not limited. My chess was very good. My English was very limited. I only spoke you know, about 200 words. Um, I had about $100 in my pocket when I uh, moved to the US and, uh, but I had, my friend's mom who picked me up at the airport and I could stay with her for free for you know several months. She was really kind to me. I started to learn, uh, learn the language, watching friends with the dictionary every single day for hours. And uh, I started to um, babysit to make uh, a living. And I also you know, had to help my dad in Georgia. So I babysat. So my friend uh, one day called me and said, can you please babysit, uh, can you please uh, work for me? Um, because she wanted to take a couple of days off and she was babysitting a family in Scarsdale. And I said, sure, you know, I'll babysit for you. And I started to babysit these kids. And one day there's a knock on the door. Uh, I open the door, guy comes in, takes out a chess board and starts to play with one of the kids I'm babysitting. And my eyes like lit up. I'm like, chess, this is great. So I go to the coach and I say, can I play with you? And he looked at me and like, okay, you know, why is this lady asking me to play chess with her? You know, she, she's distracting me from the lesson. But I was so excited. I really wanted to play chess with him. He said, okay, fine, I'll play with you at the end of the lesson. So I patiently waited till the end. And then we played Blitz and I quickly beat him. Now he was really surprised. Then we turned the board, you know, he took white pieces and we played again and I beat him again. And then he looked at me and said, hmm, what are you doing here? You should be teaching chess. So, and that's actually how uh, I got into teaching chess. I started to work for the same uh, company that Mike, Mike worked for. And that's how I uh, met Mike. And then we uh, together formed Westchester Chess Academy where we taught kids uh, for many, many years. Um, and Mike, take it off from here. Right. Yeah, it was, it was really a lot of fun to be part of, part of some of those stories. Um, so I'm going to break um, down the Queen's Gambit into somewhat of a scholastic scene too, to give you some of the scenes from from the series itself and show you how it applies to to kids today playing chess. So what you're looking at here is a typical Nationals. I think this was in Tennessee, uh, maybe eight or nine years ago. And the student that I have is uh, Isabella. She's wearing the pink in the semi foreground, and she's in what we call a visor pose. And in the Queen's Gambit, they did a really good job of a lot of the kind of sideline things that go on between tournament players. Uh, the glare is one thing when Harmon is making eye contact. They, they pushed that a little bit, but they, they were pretty accurate about um, that pose, which is, which is the visor pose. And it's designed to get you to take everything in your peripheral vision out so that you only see the 64 squares. That's not very easy to do. Um, the other really cool thing about a national tournament at, with, with young people is this is probably around a fifth grade section, fourth grade section. When you go in there, you might have five or 600 kids in one big conference center. You don't hear much. You don't hear much noise. And you know it, it's kind of rare to see that many kids in a room without really any noise. You know, if you go down to the K1 level, you're going to you're going to get a little bit more chatter. But I always was impressed with um, how young people approach the game at, at the national level. Now, Isabella was a terrific squash player and still is. I think she's 17 today. I mean, she's nationally ranked very, very high. And she used to struggle with chess. And but she would tell me that, um, you know, she kind of liked that struggle. And I, I, I didn't get a chance to talk to her. I haven't seen her in many years, but I would have been curious to go back in time 
and and find out if it if it kind of helped her squash uh, play. Now, I don't know who she's playing. She didn't know who she was playing because when you get paired in one of these big tournaments, especially at the national level, you're playing literally anyone from around the country. The next slide um, is from the Fairfield County Chess Club, which is like an amazing place to play chess in Norwalk. And this picture is slightly different. So in the foreground on the right is one of our students uh, named Fred Wang, who is a pediatric ophthalmologist with like an incredible pedigree. And he loves chess and he's in his seventies and he struggles and he fights and he plays. But if you look carefully, Fred is paired with a five-year-old who is sitting in a booster seat. And I remember him telling me after the game, I was looking at that damn red knob sticking out of the side and it was a real battle. And I said like, yeah, Fred, you know, he's five, right? He goes, yeah, but he's the highest rated kindergartner in the country. And it was just like, it's so perfect to see that happen. And of course, if you, if I hope you've all seen the Queen's Gambit and you watch the interaction of a, a young Beth Harmon with all the adults in her life, how fearless she was that she went from place to place. Uh, anyway, so the next slide is uh, taken from the show uh, when Beth is playing in her first tournament, the Kentucky State Championship, and she first meets Harry Beltic. And Beltic is playing like in round four and Beth is off to the side. And all of this is new to her. And, and all of us chess players, we're very quirky. You know, we have our little ways of standing around tables and not talking, but evidently she was chatting it up a little bit too much uh, with Towns. And Beltic whips around and says, shh, do you mind? And um, that's what you see here. Uh, you see our students surrounding these two players. Now, the reason why we did this was that, um, occurrence happens when you play in open tournaments. The last tournament you saw with Isabella, the parents are usually not allowed anywhere near the boards, nor the coaches. But once you play in open tournaments uh, down at the Marshall Chess Club or the Manhattan when it was around here in New York, and of course, all, all over the country, in open tournaments, it's very common to be walking around. And you would be amazed how difficult it is to concentrate when you look up and you see all these people looking at you because there's another phenomenon that happens to chess players. When we're not playing the game, we see everything. Like I, I said, if I could play the game standing up, I'd be rated 2,400. I don't miss anything. But in my own games, like, oh my goodness, like how did I miss that? But it's the way the human psyche works. And I think it comes from the fact that as chess players, we have an enormous amount of energy inside that we don't know what to do with. You know, if I'm playing tennis with you, uh, even if I'm not serving, I can still fake a swing. If I'm playing golf, I can, I can swing the club before I, uh, you know, take my shot. But in chess, as the game amps up, you, you, you have to know how to deal with that energy. And that's one of the things we worked on with kids. It's almost like a stage fright that you're sitting there and the chess pieces almost animate themselves. They become real. And one of the things that goes through our head a lot is, oh dear God, I hope I don't lose this position. Uh, hence the famous saying in chess, the hardest thing to do in chess is to win a one game. Because psychologically, you know you're supposed to win, but on the other side of you is an opponent who's losing. And when we're losing in chess, you have basically two options. You can set up a fortress or you can just pull the goalie and outright attack. And that makes you a very difficult opponent uh, to beat. If you look carefully at this slide, all the students are laughing, except the two players, because what I was doing is I was inching them closer just to annoy the two, uh, especially the one on the left, Ben. You can show the next slide, Julia Ray. So again, a very, very common, uh, uh, the scene work of Beth Harmon playing chess on the ceiling. Uh, visualization for chess players is enormous. As Rusa mentioned before, one of the things that we really focused on was calculation. And calculation done at a certain level is not done on the board. I mean, it is, but it isn't because we can't touch the pieces. So we have to calculate by moving them in our minds. 
And what happens to a lot of players, like I, I've seen Rusa routinely play five games of chess blindfold, which is just, you know, blows my mind. And I've also seen players of her strength kind of look away and, and Harmon was doing it all the time because they don't want to see the board because the pieces aren't moving. So they want to see the pieces moving in their head. And a great example from the show is when she meets Benny Watts and Benny Watts tells her that she made a mistake against Beltic and she could have lost. And she gets so defiant and he says, well, get up a board or get out a board and set it up. And she says, I don't need a board. And, and then, you know, she finally sits down and plays through that. The kid that you're looking here, uh, his name is Errol. Um, he didn't expect this to happen. It happened fairly recently. I had given him a famous game, a Paulson Morphy game with a uh, queen sacrifice on F3. And I told him to go over the game, make his own assessment, and then we'll, we'll work it through together. And he happens to have really good visualization skills. And he was able to play the whole game blindfold looking at the ceiling. I'm asleep, by the way. It looks like I'm, <laughs> I'm doing this with him. I, I, was, I was asleep. And he was, that's his mom's finger pointing at the game. And she didn't believe us. She thought there was some trick to it. So we did it again uh, for his dad. But um, it, it was just so great to see Errol, who's not a titled player, you know, he's not a full-time player, be able to visualize like that, uh, which was really, really nice. Uh, so the next, the next um, slide takes us into the next segment I want to talk about, which is the student teacher relationship. So obviously as coaches and educators, this is probably number one. And I, I purposely left this without a photo because I want you to kind of put this in your own heads. And I'm, I'm really so sorry that we can't see each other because uh, talking to an audience face to face, especially at a moment like this, when I'm gonna ask you to visualize something is probably more effective uh, in person, but you know, we're, we're making do. So Scheibel later in the series has a drop down scene. They just throw it right in the middle. And he's telling Beth that you're two sides of the same coin, that you have your gift and you have what it costs. And that's something that comes across us all the time. Because when you get young, talented kids or, or even adults that become either a little too obsessed about one particular part, or we'll say like, like chess, you have to be careful that it doesn't get in the way with their normal development. And he saw that in her. There's some excellent foreshadowing scenes that you see Scheibel look away and he just knows that she's on a path that might not take her to the best place. Um, and now if we hop into the next slide, another one that I purposely left without uh, a photo because this may have been my favorite sequence in the whole series. This is when he, he has the coach from the high school join him in the basement and he plays with Beth. As a matter of fact, he gives her a doll at the end, right? Such a the typical thing to do in 1957 to give her a doll. And what does she do with it? She goes back upstairs and she throws it right in the garbage. All she wanted to do is play chess. But anyway, they arrange for her to play a simul, which is when you play multiple people at once. And I think she played a 12 board simul. She goes to the high school, she's nine years old. She's sitting there with only a chaperone and the coach of the team. And you hear the dismissal bell go off and in come the chess players, but they line up like this, like they're part of the football team and like they're trying to intimidate her. And she looks confused but she's not nervous at all because she's confused about the procedure of the simul. So in her own way, she's just staring them down. And what they did was, in, was I, I don't know what in cinematography, what it's called. In chess, we call it alternation. You're, you're attacking white squares. Then you, you alternate to dark squares. You attack the queen side and then the king side. But here what they did is they kept going back and forth between Beth playing the simul and you hear her talking about how she just overran these players. And then she's back with Ms. Mr. Scheibel and they must have given her a box of chocolate because she's got chocolate all over her face. And that really, really hit me because another thing we go through as coaches, and I see Rusa smiling because we, we have seen this so much that we forget sometimes how young these players are. They're kids. 
So she's just chomping away on this chocolate. But in the meanwhile, she's talking about how, how they left themselves open to forks, backward pawns all over the place. It was just absolutely terrific. And then what I'd like you to do now, if you could, I'd like you to try to imagine looking at a kid doing something that a nine-year-old might do, and then right next to it in the same slide, think of that kid fiercely concentrating in a chess game. Take a look at the next slide. This happens to be Bruce's daughter, who's probably going to kill me when she finds out I included her here. So on the left, you know, we used to go to the library together and we would, we would uh, you know, take out books, do homework, et cetera. And then we go to city limits and White Plains for, for lunch. And she found what she thought was the biggest French fry in the history of mankind. And she's an excellent improviser, as Julia Ray mentioned before that, uh, which it's funny that I, I met Julia Ray at the chess club. They were holding improv classes. And Sophie is a great improviser. So she's talking or taking over this life. If you look at the other slide, she has absolutely no idea that I was taking the picture because she is incredibly ingrained in that game. And that's something as a coach that you have the, you have that interaction that goes back and forth where you have a young kid who starts to play chess as well as you do. And now you have a problem as an adult. And I, I really suffer from this because when I was playing a lot, a lot of times I'd have to play my students. And psychologically for most coaches, there's a big disconnect because I spend most of my time three feet away from someone that I'm nurturing. I wanna patch up any holes. I wanna prepare them for what I know it's coming. And then all of a sudden you show up on the weekend. I remember playing at the Manhattan Chess Club back in the day, getting paired with Jay Bone, an international master, week after week. So on Friday, I'm teaching how to stop the four move checkmate. And now I'm playing Bone in first thing Sunday morning. It was like, oh God, this is horrible. But you know, I hope you can appreciate that little swing that goes by. And there's a wonderful moment in the series where that materializes. And it's when Beth loses um, to Benny in, in the championship. And she tells her mother, you don't know anything about chess. She's petulant, she's like a brat. And her mom says, yeah, but I know what it's like to lose. And so do you now. And it was a great example of what happens when the chess player kind of gets brought back to where they are in life. Now, the next slide is um, just the end of a, of a game, which is another great feature of the Queen's Gambit. All of the chess that you get to watch is real. It's accurate. These are real games. So the game that uh, where Beth checkmate Scheibel here uh, with the pawn on d5 was played in 1620. And um, so that was really good that they, they produced real chess on the board. And after the game is over, he gets up and he hands her a, a book. It, I think it was the MCO, Modern Chess Openings. And he gives it to her and he said, for you to use this, you're going to have to learn how to um, read chess notation. And she asked him, she goes, am I good enough for that? And all through the show, through the first four or five sequences, Scheibel is a sorely grumpy man. He's sitting in the back. What are you doing in the, you should be upstairs, child. I don't play chess with girls. He had all these great lines. I don't play chess with strangers, he also said, to which she responds, I'm not a stranger, I live here. It was just great interaction between those two. But the one time that I found in the series that he had a look of complete admiration is the next slide, which is his answer to her when she says, am I good enough? And he responds to tell, to tell you the truth of it, child, you are astounding. And maybe if there's time in the Q and A or if this was a live interaction, I didn't get a chance to read the book. Uh, I had somebody who emailed me a, a great email about it. I just didn't have time to read the book. I'd love to know if he had his own kids, you know, cause he had, he had that look that there was something about his life that was a little dark, a little lonely, you know, he was kind of a recluse, but if, if the Q and A, if there's time, if anybody's read the book, I'd be curious to know about his background. And now the final sequence for you um, is, when you talk about transferable skill in chess, what I found myself repeating to students 
year after year after year is this concept of the wall, which is basically another word for an obstacle that you absolutely have to become friends with. I don't care if you want to become an improviser, a chess player, you want to play the tuba. I, I don't care what you want to do. You are going to level up at some point. You're going to, you're going to look up and you're going to realize you're in a different room. And now there's a whole new set of obstacles that you're going to have to, you're going to have to get over. Uh, like the next slide. Oof, I'm, <laughs> I'm holding my breath because I fairly recently started following this guy. And I know there's got to be dozens of you watching this that know who he is, Alex Honnold, who's thought to be like the premier free soloing climber. And basically free solo is you're up on a mountain or a cliff face, he's probably 2000 feet in the air. And all he's got is a chalk bag and his, and his shoes. So you wanna talk about a wall. But the reason I included this, so obviously his stakes are very real. But the reason I included it, if you watch interviews or, or watch videos with Alex, he's very calm and it becomes just relative. How afraid is he here? I would venture to say that he's less amped up here than I am when I play a chess game at some point and he's 2000 feet in the air. Now, how did he get there is quite a story. You know, eight, nine, 10 years of intense preparation but still the guy's 2000 feet in the air. And the next slide, Julia Ray, please. If you put it all together, you want to walk away with a transferable skill. How about you have the ability to constantly, constantly take on the obstacles that are coming your way and you act in real time, which happens when you play a game of chess. You can't walk away. You either resign or you get checkmated. Here is on the left is a kid, a young man that I, I taught when he was the age of, of the boy on the other side. He was six when we taught each other. And I made a couple of phone calls preparing for this lecture and Eric was one of them. And I asked him like, what did you take away from this experience? And he made master Eric. And if you read the top, he, he recalled instantly losing a game when he was Ashwin's age uh, to a, another student named Mahiro totally winning. He got cocky and he lost. And then we started to chat and he said, man, I walked, I walked away with a, a great respect for discipline. And now the, the final slide, uh, these two characters, all the chess players in the audience uh, certainly know the one on the right. Um, the guy on the left is Michael Ainsworth, um, just a terrific kid down at John Hopkins, microbiologist now. I, he's got a really strong arm. We play baseball all the time. I have a bone bruise, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, you can tell by the way he's built. And I called these guys out of the blue. And, and I said to him, you know, did you see the Queen's Gambit? Oh, I saw a part of it. I did, I didn't. Well, what about all the chess you played? Would you pull away? And Michael thought for a little while and he said, you know, it really, really helped me put pressure in perspective. He's a really good baseball player, but when he first got down to Hopkins, he was third string. So where are you going? You either quit the team or you keep playing until you move up. And he did. And he credited the chess for that, that kind of grit and the ability to, to push past that. And he also said, you know, he looked up, like almost from a calculating pose, he was at bat his first time. He realized he's playing baseball in front of his whole college and that eventually that moved away. But it's the same feeling we get as chess players, you know? And then finally, uh, Josh Colas. He's the highest rated of them all. Here, it's, he's in the scene just working with me. We're teaching together. And if you see the way he's sitting, that's the way he sits when he plays. He's always in this kind of semi-chin rest. And he's not playing a big game. He's playing one of my students because there's an odd number. But he looks like he's playing a big game because he can't help it. That's the way he's built. His demeanor never changes. His answer was very interesting. I said, Josh, you know, and I knew his dad from years ago, we played together in the city. And I asked him the question, like, what did you take away from all this? And he paused the longest, highest rated, he paused the longest. And he said, it humbled me. The game of chess humbled me. He said, it changes all the time. And he, he plays classically controlled games, which could last four or five, six hours. And he talked about, spending five or six hours against somebody who's just as good or better than you, what's happening on the board is changing. 
and then you lose. And then you go to bed at night and Rusa talked in great detail about this and have to deal with those emotions. You add it all up and you, you hear these students talk about what the game has given them. Man, it made every, every second of what I've done and what Rusa has done uh, worth every bit of it. Um, the only advice or only regret I should say that I have is that I didn't journal this. I'm too much of an improviser and I should have been. I actually told a, friend, a mutual friend of Julia Reyes and I who's an actress, I said, start a journal and, and write this stuff down because it's, it's real important. So thank you all so much. It's been a, a real pleasure presenting some of this to you. All right, thank you guys so much. That was so interesting. Um, and I, what I love about you too so much um, is, is that you have so much passion for this game. And I think that that's something that not a lot of people fully understood on the mainstream until the Queen's Gambit game gave us the opportunity. Um, and so we just have a couple minutes. Um, so I'm gonna look through quickly the um, audience q and I'm so sorry, everybody that asked questions um, that I won't be able to, that we won't be able to answer tonight, but um, you can reach out to our presenters or the library anytime and we'll get you the information that you want. Okay, so um, somebody asked, somebody complimented your hair, Rusa. <laughs> um, oh, what, so, hey, what about me? And Mike, you never looked better. Thank you. Um, somebody asked, is your love of chess ever a challenge for the people in your life who are not chess players or chess lovers? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. Yes, it can be a challenge, you know, especially when I used to dedicate a lot of my time to playing chess, it is very hard, you know, I'm sure it was very hard for my husband because I used to travel a lot playing chess and I was gone for two weeks at a time. So it was very challenging. But again, you know, if you have somebody who really loves you, they also love what you do and they support you all the way. So uh, while it's tough at times, I, I think, you know, um, it's also great, you know, great game to learn. I mean, he, I offered him to uh, learn, but he said, uh, he doesn't like to lose, so, you know, he's not playing against me. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Uh, and I will send out their contact information in the chat right now. Let's see. Um, we also have a question. Um, if people, Rusa, I don't know if you could speak to this. Mike, you might be able to speak to this. If the um, if playing against real masters, if, if people really reacted the way they did, on the Queen's Gambit. Can you speak to that experience? Yeah, I, I think it's it's a it was a little overblown at times. And I think that was just good drama because the, the series took off. I think they knew it was well done when they produced it. And I think they wanted to really include everybody else and keep those scenes dramatic. But you don't see, you don't really see uh, anything over dramatic. You will occasionally get somebody that'll walk off the board without shaking hands, you will. Um, but in terms of some of the th antics that went on between um, players, I, I just think that was just a cool way to make it more. But what was true is the, the uh, adjournments and the, and the preparation that was going on behind the scenes. That's, that part was absolutely true. So I hope I answered that question. All right, so uh, Christina, a friend of ours, Mike, um, wants to know ah. if you have any recommendations for beginners, um, join a club, get a coach, play online, what's, what's the best way to get started? And I think that this is unfortunately going to be our last question of the evening, but a very uplifting note, if either of you have some advice about getting started and, um, and, and how, to, how to begin. Yeah, I mean, I would advice to uh, do anything you can, you know, just uh, make a chess.com account. The chess.com offers a lot of lectures. You know, you can play games, do puzzles, uh, take lessons from Mike. He's a great coach. <laughs> uh, you, but you, the key I, I is, you actually, know, immerse yourself. <laughs> actually, I know who uh, I know who asked that question. So we would probably swap Spanish for chess, which would be very cool. But no, you don't uh, you don't need to spend money at the beginning. You, you can just get on YouTube. And, and just type in beginning chess, just to see if you like it. There's enough information there for free everywhere, just to see if you like it. And I would highly recommend that before you spend any money. And if it turns out you do like it, you could always reach out through the library or the email addresses, be happy, more than happy to, to take you to the next step. 
Such great advice um, and such great stories. That's what we're all about at the library. We love um, reading stories. We love hearing stories. We love sharing stories. So thank you so much um, yeah. for your time, Rusa and Mike. We really appreciate it. Um, and you know, I think I have to rewatch the Queen's Gambit. I don't know about you guys. Oh, but, it's uh... great. I'm going to watch it again. It's great. <laughs> Julia Ray, thank you very much. You do you do an incredible job. I've worked with you in the past, and you're always aces. Really appreciate what you do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia Ray. It was a pleasure. Thanks for tuning thank in, everyone. Thank you so much, and have a great night.